The federal government has made a series of big policy announcements ahead of this month's federal budget. Among them, a $6 billion infrastructure fund to help build new homes, but there are strings attached. Provinces and territories have to meet certain conditions to access most of the money, like, for instance, allowing more multi-unit buildings. Earlier, I spoke to New Brunswick Premier Blaine Higgs about whether he's open to meeting those conditions and why he and other premiers want a meeting with the Prime Minister. Premier Hicks, nice to see you again, sir. Nice to be here, Rosemary. Thank you. I, I want to start on some of the housing announcements that uh, the federal government has made over the past 10 days or so, namely this $6 billion in a new infrastructure fund. Uh, provinces and territories would only be able to access most of it if, if you meet certain conditions, like allowing duplexes, triplexes, there are other things. Um, wh what do you make of that idea and, and having to meet those conditions? Are you open to it? Well, yes. So of course, I'm I'm open to uh, having that discussion. We, we, you know, we do have a housing crisis here. We're not unique in the country, in that sense. So yes, I'm I'm very interested to learn more of the details and what that means. We we know that multifamily housing is is likely um, going to be a key component of of what's required to meet the needs the, the quickest. Um, my, I want to work uh, with the federal government. I don't like the concept of bypassing uh, the provincial. Um, government in order to um, make things happen in, in a way that he, that he might feel is most productive. I, I think that could lead to non-productivity. But but the other challenge I would have, Rosemary, is, is just, you know, finding the ability, the capability within to actually build the homes um, and have the right have the labor force to do so. Uh, do you, do you, so you don't take any issue with the fact that they're trying to really open up zoning rules um, in your province and, and put conditions like a national building code and other things like that in, into the conditions? Or, or do you have problems with that? No, no, I don't. I think, I think we need to look seriously at, at what are roadblocks that maybe have traditionally been in place. I mean, we, we will always want to keep the, the end result on, on mind because we don't want to go look 10 years from now and say, well, what, what did we do there? We kind of lost total control and look what we've got. Yeah. Uh, but I think there, there are delays that are unacceptable in approvals. And that could be in any sector, whether it's through provincial, through the, through the, uh, the municipality. So I, I think challenging those uh, is appropriate. Okay, so so there's there's an area where you are in more agreement, perhaps, with the federal government. We'll talk about one where you are not, uh, and that, of course, is the carbon tax. Um, you are also now calling, like Newfoundland's premier and I think Nova Scotia too, for an emergency meeting with the prime minister about the tax. Have you have you had a response from him about convening this meeting, and and what would you hope that that would would come about from that? Well, no, we haven't had a, a response at this point. Um, but but I, what I would hope is a real frank discussion on on the reality of what is being proposed um, and the possibilities that do exist within our country. Um, I know there's an ideological approach here that that is being put forward at this stage, and but but when you look at the timelines of it all, it, it's not it's just physically not achievable. But the, but the bigger picture with all this as well is how how what an impact the actual. Uh, country can have on world emissions. And you know what's what's kind of uh, the hypocrisy of it all is our coal exports have doubled in the last uh, 10 years. So so you say on the one hand we want to reduce world emissions, on the other hand we're exporting more coal than we ever did to other countries. So my, my point is, is really simple. We have the resources we have, and particularly in natural gas, we can shut down, down coal plants, not continue yeah. to fuel them around the world to really have an impact on remission, emission reductions. But, but, but the government of Canada's goal is to reduce emissions in Canada. Is that not also, do you not think that that's the right goal? Is that also not also your goal in your province to, to, to focus on where you uh, can think, control things? Well, uh, I think you do both. I mean, we can continue to focus on reducing emissions and, and I'm not, I, I agree, there are opportunities for that. But to limit our ability to have the major impact on the world, and then have so much more than the, the 1.8 percent that we contribute. That's the part that I just, it doesn't make sense to me that why we would not do both. So, and, so you, yeah. and the fact that, the Sorry, fact that you know, our emissions could, could move a little bit one way or the other based on the development of, let's say, gas resources and LNG plants. And, but we're utilizing resources at a time when they're available. We're taking the load off individuals to pay more tax. Uh, in order to reduce uh, emissions because the big uh, emitters are in the industry. And, and we're really looking at not only our own industries, but looking at industries around the world.
Okay, a a couple things. I'll start with the idea of uh, exporting liquid natural gas, which, as you know, the federal government says we're not interested in doing that. We are not interested in investing because it is an inefficient fossil fuel subsidy. What evidence do you have, though, that investing in LNG would be a more effective way of cutting carbon emissions? Well, it's really clear. I mean, in, in terms so so there's one humanity uh, reality in all this where you could argue offsetting oil and gas coming from Russia in, into Europe. So so there's that aspect aside. But there are 174 coal plants in Europe. Uh, China are building 80 to 100 a year. There are 1,100 currently in China. We're feeding some of those. I'll bet a lot of those exports of coal right now are going to China. But the point I raise is that for every coal plant that we yeah. could tape to convert to natural gas, we will reduce the emissions by 50 percent. That's a bigger impact than anything else we're doing here in the time frame allotted. And, yeah. and we can do it in a you know, short order. It's happening in the U.S. It's happening in the, in the East. Well, yeah. we see well, the, the president has the president has shut down, uh, has frozen further development of LNG. And is there not an no, assumption no, he in your... Rosemary. Well, he, yes, he, he has. He yeah. has Sorry to interrupt there. He's, yeah. He said he's not going to issue any new permits. But yeah. if you look at the backlog of the permits that are already issued, he doesn't yeah. need any new permits. Uh, but I, I guess the problem with what you're suggesting is it, it, there's an assumption there that all those other countries that you've just named are going to make that transition. Um, like, we can't control what China does. So I, I, I guess I just don't quite, I, I guess I can't quite it just does. conclude the same thing as you about, well, if you do this, it will be better for the world because we don't actually have any power to to control that part well we do because if we're all on the same track to reduce emissions and we have we have four countries now maybe five that would sign 20-year agreements right today to to um, have LNG uh, imports and, and, and offset their other sources of, of, uh, of uh, energy which coal is part of that so we we that's not a problem to confirm the impact that it'll have where it's going to go and what it's going to be used for it's just we are restricting the ability to even look Right. So uh, the federal government has said to provinces, as you know, if you have a better plan, write it up, send it to me, <laughs> and we'll we'll see whether you still need the federal backstop. Are you going to do that? Do you, have you? Yes. Is that something? You, yes. And and what will be in that plan that you will send? In that plan will be not only our commitment to continue to reduce the uh, um, emissions in our own province, right. but it'll to take it off the backs of of people because affordability is such an issue. So kind of remove the affordability, allow the energy um, capabilities that we have here and the resources to be developed to to offset the affordability to actually pay for the research and development to allow us to per, per, um, to practice and be part of a world emission reduction. So there are multiple facets of this that that can be a bigger impact. So I'm asking the Prime Minister to think outside the the Canadian bubble, um, think bigger, and let our country be as good as it can be. Let let me just end, though, on on the fact that it is true that still 80 percent of Canadians get a rebate, (laughs) and and that is money in their pocket that's helping them deal with this issue right now, at least according to the government. And and that is a fact. It's eight out of ten households. But what doesn't seem to be factored into all that is the impact that transportation costs are having on other supplies that don't have a rebate, groceries, um, anything that's in the supply chain through transportation, which is everything, really, that people buy every day. So all of those factors over higher prices for for transportation, every company would have a fuel surcharge built into their commodity now because of transportation. So the fact that I'm getting a rebate on my particular usage at the pump is only a part of the story. Okay. Premier Higgs, always good of you to make the time for us. Thank you, sir. You're very welcome. Have a good day.